Hello and welcome to episode 365 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Ben Olson, that's Nathan Fox, together with the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. If you want to get on the next show, email us today, uh, Monday, August 29th, 2022. We always record on Tuesday mornings. In any case, um, the next registration deadline is Thursday, September 1st. That's for the October test, so just around the corner. You can find all these dates at lsat.link forward slash dates. If you have not yet done so, you need to come to Nathan's free shit. That's a class, by the way. That's what I meant by shit. <laughs> Yep. Um, it's a class in zoom. So wherever you are on this planet, you can join him Thursdays, 4 PM Pacific, 7 PM Eastern. The next one is Thursday, September 8th, and it's get greedy on the LSAT. What are you going to talk about? Um, so get greedy is a kind of a core philosophy at the demon. And the idea is just don't max yourself out with any particular target score. And if you've done well, it's actually a, a good reason to try for even more. Um, mm -hmm. We are reminded frequently of Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption writing letters to get funding for his uh, prison library. Sure. Where he wrote a letter every week for five years or something. And then finally they sent him some money for some books and said, please stop writing us letters. Yeah. And Andy Dufresne turned around and thanked them for their donation and spent the money and built up the library and then started sending two letters a week instead of one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's kind of what we want you to do with the LSAT. You know, we see people who are like, well, I was thrilled to see my 171. But, you know, I have practice test scores that are 177 do you think I'd be crazy to take it again? And sometimes people will tell them, oh, you'd be insane to take it again. What if you score lower? <laughs> there's no problem with scoring lower. And there's <laughs> yeah. all the worlds of benefit. All the worlds of benefit. All the worlds of benefit. <laughs> <laughs> if you take it again, because then you could get, I mean, look, if you got a 177 or a 175 or a 173 on oh. a practice test, you're going to get it on a, Actual test. Yeah, there's no reason why you can't put that on your official record. If your practice tests indicate that you're capable of that, then yeah, you are capable of that. And you should just take it again. If you score lower, who cares? Law schools care about your highest score. If you score higher at all, it's just nothing but upside. So there's every reason to get greedy on the LSAT. Um, there are other meanings to this get greedy idea, including get greedy, get greedy in terms of understanding. You know, mm -hmm. you, you want, you got to be like hungry for that understanding of one more question. And you've, you, you unlocked, you know, for example, you understood one game and you did really well on it. You want to like, let that be an appetizer for you to then get greedy <laughs> to, to understand another one. So anyway, it should be a fun class Thursday, September 1st, all you need is a demon free account. Hope to see you there. And you can find, uh, the specific syllabus for that class at LSAT dot link forward slash Nathan. And that's also where you can sign up for a demon free account. Hi highlight. What was well, your favorite part of the show? I, I, I loved every part equally. I can't, pick. <laughs> um, but <laughs> some bad no. father response, <laughs> which child was, do you uh, love the most? Obviously the first one. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> the first one is always the best. Um, uh, no, Hey, 365 episodes, Ben. Yeah. I just wanted to congratulate you. I was 20 minutes late today. <laughs> <laughs> One of many hiccups that we have uh, overcome on the way to creating now a full episode of LSAT. Uh, sorry, of thinking LSAT for every damn day of the year. That's a lot of recording. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of hours of our bullshit. We've become friends over the episodes. I mean, we like barely knew each other whoa, whoa, whoa. when yeah, we started. So. <laughs> well, you're well, my friend. Not... <laughs> Maybe I'm not your friend. Okay, fine. I'm joking. I you claim Ben uh, as my friend. I'm proud likewise, to have likewise. Ben as my friend. Um, no, 365 episodes. They're all like somewhere between an hour and two hours long. So yep. it's uh, <laughs> roughly 500 hours of our bullshit and uh our our evolving friendship over the years which has been really interesting 
we've both been through some like major life changes uh, <laughs> over the years. Do we know what year we started the podcast? I can't remember. No. Well, Six anyway, years ago, I'm, maybe I'm patting you on the back 16? as a way of patting myself on the back. And if any psychos out there want to listen to thinking else at every day, you now literally can listen to a new episode <laughs> every day for an entire damn year. Wow. Good luck with that. By the way, speaking of hiccups, what's the biggest hiccup in your mind? I definitely have one in mind. Well, the time when we recorded a whole episode lost that recording somehow, like it glitched and we couldn't get the recording. Yep. So then we met again, re-recorded the whole episode. Yep. And then it happened again. Yeah. Yes. That's the one I was thinking of. It was so painful to record that a third time. <laughs> it's like, oh, what's going to happen next? I don't know. What email are we about to read? I don't know. It's one of those stupid things. I mean, like my core advice, like if if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to start up anything, if you want to start up a podcast, you want to start up a business, you want to do whatever. My core bit of advice is just like try shit and then just keep showing up through the there's just annoyances. It's just these yeah. little annoyances, you know, like with figuring out where am I going to host my classes? I got to go rent a classroom space. How do I do that? And it's like, yeah, seems impossible until you do it. And then it's nothing. How yeah. do I do my taxes? How do I do my billing? What? I got to charge people's credit cards. Oh, my God. And it's all these just little tiny, annoying things. Mm -hmm. But if you do those little tiny, annoying things, then you get to have your own business, which is like the greatest thing ever possible. I mean, it's just amazing to be your own boss, call, make your own schedule, call all the shots. And, uh, you know, the United States financially rewards people who start businesses. It's mm -hmm. just it's just better than working for somebody else. But it, you do have to go. You got to stick to it, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And keep. Yeah. Keep improving. You can't just stick to the same old thing. It's got to grow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we've been able to do that with the podcast. The podcast has evolved quite a bit over the years, including um, launching LSAT Demon Daily, which now it's amazing to see that there's, you know, 300 episodes of that since there's five every week. Anyway, thanks to the listeners, I guess. Thanks to all of our students over the years. We wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for you guys supporting us you know even with just your emails like when you write in and thank us for the show that definitely keeps us motivated to keep doing it yeah absolutely help at thinking lsat.com all righty let's jump into this email from unbound it says hey guys please see the link below for what i found to be an interesting twist on early decision it's a uh, link from bu.edu, that is Boston University. Okay. Unbound continues and says, quote, distinguished scholar seems low risk since it comes with a full tuition scholarship. And if not admitted through it, your application rolls into the regular admission pool, whereas, quote, BU bound seems like a setup for a life of indentured servitude. Curious to get your take on this dual track early decision program. And again, that's coming from Unbound. I thought it was. <laughs> it is kind of amusing, like they're not hiding anything at all on that, are they? Mm -mm. Did you click the link? You check out their, yeah. their story? Yeah. So I haven't read it all yet, but what sticks out to you? Well, it's so they have two different, quote, early decision programs, right? The yeah. first one they call Distinguished Scholar. You actually have to apply early. Mm -hmm. um, well, early ish. November 10th is the application deadline. We would prefer that you apply, you know, broadly before that. But, um, you know, th that is a program that includes a three year full tuition scholarship. OK. And if you don't get in, they just roll you into regular decision. Yep. OK, so I have no problem at all with the well, although it is binding, it is binding. It, yeah, that's the catch, right? That's so what you're that's what you're getting. Yeah, like return. don't get into or that. That's what you're giving in return. Yep. It, I mean, you're going to feel like an ass if you get into that and then you also get into Harvard. Mm hmm. 
<laughs> like you've you've committed to be you to turn down Harvard before Harvard even like don't apply to Harvard if you're going to yeah. do that program. Yeah. Right. So you should know based on your numbers that you're like, yeah, I'm a I'm a pretty, you know, I'm a decent scholarship candidate for BU, but I there's no way in hell I'm getting into Harvard. And if if I can go to BU for free, then, yeah, I'll go to BU for free. That's my best choice. That's my first choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that really would be like a stretch and like a really good outcome for you, then fine. But, you know, you are foreclosing your opportunity to go to any other school at, who also could give you a full ride, who might also give you a stipend. Yep. Who knows? I mean, we've seen University yeah. of Michigan give people ten thousand dollars a year stipend. That's a definitely a better school. And if that's an offer that might be available to you, then you'd be dumb to apply for this BU Distinguished Scholar Binding Early Decision Program. Yeah. Their other program, I laughed at the name of it just because they're just straight up calling it BU <laughs> Bound. bound. And, I, and I, <laughs> I, I, they meant it to mean like this exciting thing like, oh, I'm bound um, for BU. And it's like, well, actually, you're bound to BU um, and you're also going to be bound to a mountain of debt. Because it says right off the bat, applicants admitted through the BU bound binding decision program will not be considered for merit scholarships. Wow. Wow. Yeah. They're saying we are just going to take you. We're going to take you and we're going to hold you to the commitment that you made. Yep. And there it's a late deadline. You know, it's a January 5th deadline and mm -hmm. they're going to notify you by February 1st. And if you really need to make your parents happy and if your parents are going to pay the sixty five thousand dollars a year or whatever insane tuition BU charges, because they're telling you right off the bat, we're not going to give you any merit money at all. If you apply through this program, listen to this next sentence. It says applicants for whom financial aid is necessary for enrolling should not apply through the BU bound binding decision program, but rather through the regular decision program. So they're. They're really, they crafted this program, this BU bound binding decision program for rich kids. I'm just imagining shackles. Well, it's so funny, BU bound. Yeah. But yes, they invented this program. Go ahead. For rich kids. Yep. They're like, yes. okay, we want rich yep. kids to come here and fund our high performing kids who are probably also rich, but we want some people to come here and fund the rest of the program. No shortage of rich kids uh, at BU and BC. I mean, I've lived in Boston for a while, so there's lots of rich kids around, lots of rich parents around. And if that's you and you, you know, it, it's just it's shitty because it's like, oh, I don't want to work that hard on my LSAT. Oh, I don't want to wait another cycle and apply early. I don't want to, like, get my legal career off on the right foot. I just want to pay for it. So I'll take the LSAT once, get some mediocre score apply BU bound <laughs> and then my folks will pay this exorbitant tuition. I mean, it's fine, I guess. Like that's the system. Somebody has to pay for the scholarship kids. So might as well be those in the BU bound program <laughs> who at least at the, you know, they're, they're, at least, they're right off the bat. They're like, no, I understand. You're not going to consider me for merit based aid or, or any aid. This is financial aid is necessary, right? So well, yeah, I mean, there's but yeah, there I think they mean they're like if you can't afford it without grants because anybody can afford it with loans, which they also call financial aid. So they're kind of misspeaking mm. there, I think mm -hmm. they just they don't want you to get in through this and then start crying about like, well, but where's my scholarship? Yeah, that's I think all they're trying to do there. Um, what do you, I'm going what do you to, think about the sorry, really quick? What do you think yeah. about the fact that the deadline is later? This really just seems like a bottom feeder yeah program well i mean they're, it's middle they're feeding even... <laughs> yeah it's it's feeding off of the middle of the you know the bulk right right when the bulk of people are applying so mm -hmm. it's it's just not that they, they no i mean their other program is trying to like get superstars right or or stars mm -hmm. that are willing to bind themselves to be you if a full ride is associated with mm -hmm. it and that's like yeah okay for for those spots it's actually going to be competitive and you have to apply early. This other one is just like, oh, you want us to lower our standards a little bit because you're willing to lower your standards a little bit. Let's just jointly lower our standards together. 
and mm-hmm. you pay us a shit ton of money. Cool. Mm-hmm. That's the other mm-hmm. program. And that, that one has like, it's like you get the late checkout on that one. You know, oh, you're paying $600 a night for the room. You can stay a little later. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're fine. It's a resort. It's fine. <laughs> I wanted to look up really quick. Um, Boston University in the rankings. Um, where's there's Boston College. So Boston University Law currently ranked 17th by U.S. News. Um, where's B.C.? I want to see if they're actually different according to the uh, what do we, we call it? 2X rule now. B.C. is yeah. at 37. So Boston uh, University is a noticeably better law school, although <laughs> Again, law school rankings are complete bullshit because there's been other times when BU and BC are like within five digits of each other and Absolutely. now they're like double yeah. each other. So what what does any of this even mean? But what yeah. I wanted to look at was the BU um, 509 so that we can look into a little bit more what's happening here. Scrolling down to the scholarship stuff, which is at the bottom of the second page. Yeah, that's a school where. 17% is getting a full tuition scholarship. Another 32% is getting somewhere between half and full. 91% of their whole school is getting some kind of a grant. So if you play, if you, if you apply BU bound, you're like, I want to be part of that 9%. My parents are part of the 1%. I want to be part of the 9% that pays full price at BU. So I'm going to apply BU bound. <laughs> the privileges that being part of the 1% offers you, you can be at the bottom 9% of your class. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not guaranteed to finish in the bottom 9% of your no, class, but, um, but the scho- you're going to have the scholarship kids are going to be no joke. I mean, those people that apply earlier than you with a way higher LSAT who earned a full ride to that school, you're going to, Yeah. <laughs> that's going to be some stiff competition. Yep. Thanks unbound for sending that in. That was a great little bit of intelligence, by the way, I really appreciate it when people email us, uh, help at thinking little news or tidbits, interesting new programs that the law schools are putting out there. That was super helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, let's jump into pearls versus turds. This is where we take some uh, wisdom from wherever and decide whether it's good or bad. I guess I shouldn't say wisdom, some advice. (laughs) It's not wisdom yet. Yeah, it's (laughs) advice. And we're trying to decide whether it is a pearl of wisdom or if it goes on the turd pile. Um, This one came from Haley on our team, uh, forwarded this from, I I believe, a demon student. Okay. Hey, y'all. Was doing some drilling and thought of a good phrase to keep in mind that has helped me out. Wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Quote, pick the answer that is hardest to argue against. This helps me get into the right mindset of picking apart each word in the answer and seeing if it ruins the answer choice. If you're being critical enough, you'll often reject all five before lowering your standards and going back through, almost like checking the fridge for food, (laughs) not seeing anything satisfying enough and checking again a little later with lower standards. (laughs) Okay, Brad. Uh, Let me know what you think. Thanks for everything you do. Uh, my initial reaction to this is not an immediate vomiting, you know? I agree. Yeah. Pick the answer that is hardest to argue against. It acknowledges that the correct answer is not always perfect. True. Um, I think it's really good for must be trues, supported strategy questions, necessary assumption questions, flaw questions, anything where the burden is on you to prove an answer it's like you're vouching for that answer well you don't want to vouch for something that's easy to argue against Mm -hmm. so pick the one that is undeniable right on on those types of questions yeah i wonder how i feel about it i'm not sure how i feel about it on strengthen questions or weaken questions i could still see some value in it in the sense that uh sometimes you know, these answer choices require us to make some sort of an assumption and people are arguing against that assumption. And it's, it comes down to, okay, 
how big of an assumption do you really think that is? And they're, oh, I don't know. Well, you know, I can't make assumptions. And it's like, uh, yeah, but you have to make an assumption for this other answer choice too. Which one is the one that's hardest to argue against? Which one, which assumption is the hardest to <laughs> compete with? Right? Yeah. And if you interpret it in a way, then one of them is 100% correct. You know, it's like they they intended it for to be like 100% correct when they wrote it. And if you like every word has subtle shades of meaning, right? Mm -hmm. And so I love this idea of rejecting all five and then go, OK, well, nothing in there that I really love. Mm -hmm. Let me go through. I'll have to lower my standards just a little bit mm -hmm. to give them another shot. And then it's like, oh, I read this word to mean that, but you maybe meant this word to mean this. Mm -hmm. And if this word means this, then, yeah, it totally clicks and it's 100 percent correct. So I like that idea. Yeah, I think even on strengthen and weaken questions. So what I don't want people to do is to be on a strengthen question and on a weaken question and sufficient assumption um, paradox all the answer driven question types. You do have to accept the truth of the answer, right? You're not supposed to be arguing against the answer because the question told you which one of the following, if true, mm -hmm. does a thing. So I don't want this tip to be taken as I'm going to just argue against every answer all the time. Absolutely. No, you have to accept those answers as true. The real issue is, does that fact strengthen the argument yeah. and some people are going to take issue with the connection between that fact and the argument on some occasion yeah but so i guess the thing to do here as far as this pick the answer that is hardest to argue against think about what if it's true then what would you say to argue against it you know what i mean mm -hmm. like what would the other side say if mm -hmm. this came into the right if i brought this in to strengthen my argument what would the other side say? Yep. And there, yeah, I want to pick the one that is the hardest to argue against. So mm -hmm. if there is some assumption or something that like, well, you know, we're interpreting this this way to mean this thing. And then that's yep. how it strengthens the argument. What's the other side going to have to say to try to interfere with that line of reasoning? What and are then the rebuttals? Compare, mm -hmm. compare yeah. how hard they're going to have to work to argue against any of these other answers. Yeah. Because what's going to happen is the other answers, it's like, well, they're going to blow those out of the water. Mm -hmm. Like these are useless. This one. OK, maybe it's not perfect. Yeah, I like it. Hardest to answer to, uh, the hardest answer to argue against. I'm willing to give it a pearl, Ben, if you are. I am. I, I was wondering if I would say it in class and I could see myself saying it in class, especially when someone <laughs> is arguing with answers. OK, fine. You have an issue with this, but. Is it harder to argue against this or harder to argue against that? Yeah. As always, you know, <laughs> don't don't take this to be the be all end all of logical reasoning, because one huge mistake that students make is that they just always want to dive right into the answer choices too quickly to begin with. Sure. Absolutely. Right. And with this, like, oh, well, I'm just going to pick the answer that's the hardest to argue against. So, uh, a. And it's like, what? You didn't even read the argument. You didn't read the question. What are you doing looking at the answer choices? Yeah. And that's yeah. pretty common, right? Yeah, super common. Uh, okay. I was confused about question 19. I was stuck between C and D. And it's like, whoa, whoa. 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 <laughs> Everybody slow down. <laughs> read the argument to, the to me. Yeah, let's see if we can understand this argument. Okay. The scoreboard is 20 pearls, 60 for 65 turds, and 24 ties. If you have a pearl versus turd candidate, email help at thinkinglsat.com, or you can find us on social at thinkinglsat. This next email is from Anonymous. You got it? It says, hey, Ben and Nathan, I have a PhD in biochemistry, cell, and molecular biology with a focus in virology and have done research in academia and industry. Wow. I okay. would like to transition into biotech slash pharma intellectual property law. Okay. 
why? Yeah, that was my question too. <laughs> what what prompted that decision? Maybe you know a lot about this and this makes sense, but it's the thing is you're tr- you're you're looking to transition into law. Right. It's you're you're going to have to go to law school to be trained as a generalist. You're going to have to pass the bar, which is about general legal practice. And then I believe you that you'll be able to find your way into biotech pharma. But like IP law is just this whole giant area of arcane shit that you're do you really want to be a lawyer or do you want to do science? Because if you want to do science, this ain't going to be science. Nope. You're moving away from the science and moving toward refereeing scientific disputes. Well, toward arguing about money, like fighting for money is Mm -hmm. essentially what you're going to be doing. So are are you really going to be satisfied doing that? Or do you want to use your Ph.D. in science and, you know, with a focus in virology? I mean, do you want to like study? Do you want to like cure diseases or do you want to fight over money (laughs) essentially is what this transition is going to be so anyway anonymous says should i study and take the ip bar exam first become a patent agent and leverage that to get into law school what the fuck i'm confused because it's not hard to get into law school like no, you're- <laughs> to get into law school, get a high LSAT score. I, I mean, I would consider taking this path for a different reason, not to get into law school, but to figure out whether this is the path you want to take, assuming that you can do it more quickly and less expensively than law school. Yeah. Anonymous continues. If I pass the IP bar, I could possibly work as a patent agent while I attend law school part time. And yeah, I mean, I've had former students who have taken that path and that seems to be a really good path. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like so anonymous continues here. Or would you suggest that I do law school first and then study and take the IP bar exam after law school to become a full patent attorney? If you're going to have to take it either way. I would take it first because if you hate it, you're done and you haven't wasted three years of your life and some money on law school. Yeah, this is this is like idea seems pretty half cocked, honestly. Right. It's like the, the and I mean, we appreciate you for emailing in, but it doesn't seem like you have any idea what you're getting yourself into. I imagine law school would set the foundation for the IP bar, making it easier. No, I think it's I the other way around. Be. No, I, or I yeah. don't think you learned anything in law school for the IP bar. I think that's well, a totally different deal. I don't know. I'm not an expert in this area, but think about how much law school prepares people for the bar exam. It does like zero. Yeah. So why would it prepare people more for IP? It not at all. Yeah. Um, anonymous continues. Also, I am old, 42. That's not old. Do you think the time I spent getting research experience will help me enough in IP law to make my age not as big of an issue? And then, okay, I have a 3.64 UGPA and had a cold 156 LSAT diagnostic on Khan Academy. Don't use Khan for your prep, please. Khan sucks for prep. Use us. um, Biased, but (laughs) LSAT demon is way better. You're going to end up, I mean, like. If you studied with us, I would have no doubt that you're going to end up in the 170s. 156 yeah. cold STEM degree, PhD in biochemistry. Like you're not going to have a hard time with the LSAT. You're going to you're going to kill the LSAT. Yep. So 3.64 in STEM and a 170 something, you're already a candidate for I would think you're going to get offers from top 14 schools. Mhm. So and that's regardless of your age. It has nothing to do with that. I, I don't I think you're worrying about lots of wrong things. I mean, you don't you don't have to do law schools are going to be begging to have you like law schools would be extremely lucky to get someone like you. It's very rare that people with science brains. Want to transition into law. So 
I, I don't know. I would just encourage you to do more research about IP law specifically. Like, do you know IP lawyers? You need to know IP lawyers. What they do and whether they like it and whether you're likely to like it. <laughs> what their path was. Did they did they do the patent agent thing while they were in law school? Did they go part time to law school? How did they get their job? Did they have to go practice in big law for 10 years first? Or were they able to go straight into this kind of IP work that you seem to be interested in right out of law school? Is that even a thing? I, like, I just I don't know that there is a path. I, I, there, there must be a, a path to this job. Any final words for Anonymous? No, you're going to learn a lot more, though, from talking to someone who actually does this. You're going to know <laughs> what you need and what you don't need better than you can learn it from us. All right, we got another, we got a couple anonymous in a row here. Okay. Hey, I just wanted to share some recent success I've had solely because of the podcast. I took a cold practice test this past January and scored a 149. That was my spring semester of my senior year. And being a Division I athlete, I had trouble being consistent with my studying. From then till about late May, I was using other LSAT resources that proved to not get me anywhere. I took another practice test in May only to find my score stayed exactly the same. Although I wasn't consistently studying throughout this period, I was still very surprised my score did not move despite me having an understanding of the test, or at least I thought I did. In May, I won a free Blueprint three-month class giveaway and thought the regimented schedule would help me. At this point, I would begin listening to Thinking LSAT a lot more, and it made me see how stupid the course I was doing was. Hmm. I was also on the job search at the time, so I decided to drop the class and focus on that process. Fast forward to now, I'm in my new job, and I just got a 157 on the first practice test I've done since May, only by following the advice you gave on the podcast. Understanding each question and looking at it critically has really resonated with me. Although I spent six months learning each question type and conditional logic. Ugh. Yeah, seriously. In taking my most recent practice test, I didn't once think about, hmm, is this a pseudo sufficient assumption question BS? I've <laughs> seen that out there. The pseudo sufficient assumption. It's funny. I simply read the argument critically, understand it, read the question, understood it. And by this point, I could predict the answer mostly. My weakest section was logic games, which was promising, minus seven, because I have not, I haven't allotted much of any studying to that besides basics, basic one semi or colon one, one to one games. What's one to one games? No clue. I we didn't don't do types here, so you're not helping yourself with the <laughs> that nomenclature. Yeah. I didn't understand three logical reasoning questions, four to five difficulty. And I wasn't able to reach the last three, although I got those right afterwards very quickly. My reading comp was minus six because I rushed the last passage due to time pressure and didn't fully understand. I plan on using Demon Live soon because I can now afford it and just started using just started using the free version last week. But in the meantime, I would like to thank you both for the podcast and your free wisdom. Oh, there's wisdom. Maybe we have maybe we have wisdom. <laughs> I finished trying. my trying, yeah. I finished my undergrad with four four .0s the last two years. LSAC will be three point six, I think, and I have an ultimate goal of one seventy three plus as a URM. I will absolutely not pay for someone else's tuition, so I'm taking all the time I need to study. I would like to apply in fall of twenty twenty three, so I feel pretty optimistic about my goal, and I look forward to using Demon Live. If you have any advice on how I should continue going forward, I'll be happy to hear. Currently, I try to get in at least one quality hour of studying every day after work. I mean, it sounds like you're listening to the podcast and you understand most of the advice we're giving you. I think it's smart to start with Demon Live. Um, I hope the price isn't holding you back from doing Demon Basic or anything like that. But I am slightly concerned about the fact that you rushed the last passage of Reading Comp we like to say over and over and over that time doesn't matter. And it sounds like you know that, but you're still letting it get to you. Yeah, your your problem was actually that you missed questions on the first three passages on reading comp. Because 
if I, if we only had three passages and we could guess on the last passage, we should still be able to get minus six, mm-hmm. which is what you got. So you're saying you did the last passage, but you rushed it. So you got some of them right, but not all of them right. That means you also missed questions on the first three passages. And you've really just got to dedicate yourself to not making mistakes. Commit to that idea. Yeah. But I mean, you're going in the right direction. This is great to to hear. We look forward to seeing you in class. Do you have any other advice? 149 is a great diagnostic. I mean, that's like totally solid place to start. Many people mm-hmm. will make it to 170 if they started at 149. Bummer that you wasted three months um, with another prep course. Bummer that you s- spent six months learning question types and conditional logic. <laughs> I mean, that's just a terrible waste of time. You need to be doing practice tests and practice sections and like actually doing the real test instead of learning all this theory. Yeah. Yeah, do do one month of Demon Live as soon as you have the time in your schedule and um, just give it your best best shot from there. You're 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 doing one hour of one quality hour of studying every day after work. Might not be possible, but I would consider maybe moving that one hour before work. I know that that has helped other students in the past get more out of their study time because after work, I mean, depending on how taxing your job and your commute are, and you know, then you could get distracted by dinner and TV and whatever. And maybe if you just set your alarm an hour earlier, you'd be less rushed uh, and uh, really get in that high quality one hour of work. Yeah, I think it's worth considering and and possibly trying. Um, that's not to say, though, that we're saying, oh, if you're studying after work, you can't do that. Of course, maybe that's your best hour and that's what you should do. But definitely worth considering. It's nice to do things when you have more willpower. My only concern is you wake up too early. You got that mental fog. Just, you know, some people got to figure out whatever that best hour is. Yeah, well, I guess that's what I'm saying. Wherever your best hour is. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, this next one is from Anonymous. It says, hey, Ben and Nate, I was wondering if writing my personal statement on how I didn't do well in school in my past <laughs> is a good idea. Nope. No, it's not. You're applying for school. You do not want to emphasize anything related to you being bad at school. <laughs> Let's draw more attention to my failings. Nope. No, it's like if you your GPA <laughs> if your GPA is bad, you don't want to draw attention to that. You want to draw attention to other stuff. Mhm. Um anonymous continues. For example, I was a terrible high school student. Okay, but nobody gives a shit. High school yeah, no. grades aren't reported to the law school. High school is high school. That's in the past. That's not what that's not today. So we don't ever want to hear really anything about high school students on your personal statement. I mean, unless you really achieved something extraordinary, like you were in the Olympics while you were in high school, which you could have been, then that's a reason to write your personal statement about high school. But otherwise, no. Anonymous continues, I was dealing with bullying slash chronic stress on a daily basis and finished with a 2.3 GPA semicolon. It was hell. Again, you just don't even that sucks, but you you don't need to mention that at all. I had to start my first semester of community college on academic probation due to failing dual enrolled classes I took in high school. Unless that shows up on your community college transcript, I don't think you should ever put it anywhere in your law school application. It's, you know, it's just not helping. It, it, all it's doing is muddying the waters at all, right? I mean, yep. they go on and say, that was when I woke up and dedicated myself to being the best student possible. It also helps that I love the college environment and don't have to deal with assholes who pick on me anymore. 
I have gotten nothing but straight A's since attending actual college classes. My LSAC GPA is a 3.64. It would be higher if I had taken school more seriously when I was in high school, but it's whatever. All I can do is move forward. So my question is, should I write about this in a personal statement? As you guys recommend, I want to show how much I have grown and accomplished. This is an addendum. You could say my GPA for my college classes is a whatever, 4.0, supposedly. I have a 3.64 because of some high school classes. Yeah, due to some dual enrollment high school classes. But don't go into the bullying. Don't go into the stress. Don't go into the assholes who used to pick on you. That really sucks. And I'm sorry that that all happened, but it just doesn't. It's not a feather in your cap. It doesn't help. It's it's you're not getting into law school because of sympathy. You're getting into law school because 3.64 is a pretty solid GPA and you write that addendum and you say, hey, I had a 4.0 for the last seven semesters of, you know, with of college. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. That And if that's the story we're talking about, then, well, this is not, I don't mean to suggest that this should get into your personal statement. I'm just saying that your application is a story. It's a package story. And one small piece of that story is this addendum. And that small piece looks really good. All my college classes, I have a 4.0. Okay, great. We don't need to hear anything about this past stuff. Instead, let's talk about something else that you've done recently and done well. Yeah, if you want, I mean, you say it in the last line of your email, you say, I want to show how much I have grown and accomplished. Focus on the accomplished part. Yeah. I mean, we all used to be kids. We all have grown. We all were idiots in high school. So that goes without saying. I mean, the accomplishments are things that you've actually achieved after you did all of this growth. And, you know, if you're like still in college, I don't know, maybe you don't have huge achievements or anything, but Maybe you were involved in a campus organization. Maybe you worked while you were in school or maybe you're a couple of years out of school and you have some work stories to tell. Yeah, I would maybe write a two sentence addendum to explain the increasing, you know, just to point out that the grades actually are better. Mm -hmm. But the the feather in your cap there is that the long string of straight A's. It's not the growth. It's the it's the A's. That is really the feather in your cap. Yep. Because it's so easy to talk about growth, but then have nothing to show for it. You have something to show for it. So I don't even need you to talk about the growth. It just emphasize your grades. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> to, to, to illustrate this point even just a little bit more, imagine someone applying who said, yeah, I had a 4.0 in high school and I had a 4.0 in college. And what you're saying is, oh, I had a 4.0 in college, but I had a lower GPA in high school. Therefore, what? That's better? No, it's not better. It's like I. I might admire that you were able to overcome this bullying, and I, I know that that can be just fucking terrible. And I'm I'm glad that that's not an issue anymore. But the law schools are like, what's in it for me? Who am I mm-hmm. getting here? Mm hmm. And you coming in with like, well, I really got bullied a lot in high school is like, how does that help me? Want to read this one from Alexander? Hey, Ben and Nathan, I came across the demon recently and your strategies have shocked me. Given my experience with a different tutor. Okay. My previous instructor told me that I shouldn't use real practice tests and that to train myself at understanding the test, I should create my own logical reasoning and reading comp questions instead and answer them accordingly while studying with the games that he provided for me. Oh, that is so incredibly backwards on so many levels. First of all, there are plenty of official practice questions out there, so you don't need to waste your time creating your own. But even if you were to foolishly create your own, creating your own question and then turning around and answering it seems highly unproductive 
what you know the correct answer that's shocking you just wrote the question itself um <laughs> so <laughs> i don't i'm sorry that you had that experience uh, and i wonder what that tutor's motivation is maybe to avoid the lsac licensing fees I that's no the idea. only thing i could think of is that they don't have an lsac license and <laughs> they don't want to pay money for the books of 10 which are cheap 20 by the way. bucks I mean, 20 on bucks amazon for 10 for, whole tests that's a thousand questions boom for 20 bucks okay anyways yeah <laughs> uh alexander continues i learned how to diagram not just on games but on logical reading logical reasoning and reading comp as well interesting in okay lots of you learned diagram. how to diagram on logical reasoning and reading comprehension hmm what'd you diagram on reading comp that's that's <laughs> what'd you diagram on logical reasoning i mean i we don't i don't do i never ever do that i don't i do not diagram on either of those sections we don't do that but we can we've seen lots of people and i myself have done it before so i can um, i can imagine one or two questions where people might be tempted to do this but reading comp kind of blows my mind i I might diagram sometimes for teaching purposes, just so that I can make it explicit how the parts of the argument link to one another. But eventually you have to be able to do that in your head because you can't do it correctly on the page if you can't do it in your head in the first place. Well, hold on. I want to clarify something there. I don't even think you're diagramming in your head. I think you're using a different part of your head when you try to understand. A I think that's right. Like I actually understand it and then I can, if I want, translate it into visual representation yeah the problem with diagramming is then people shut off that intuitive part of their brain and they just like become a robot oh and then, and then you confuse sufficient mistakes. for necessary or, <laughs> or whatever you miss yeah. up something else that they're not testing with the, the arrows anyways reading comp is really bizarre i was instructed to quickly skim reading comp passages oh. jeez louise is this tutor like listening to us and just providing the exact opposite do, do advice the exact opposite yeah <laughs> And then diagram them, <laughs> skim it, diagram it. What? Wow. This is just really, your score should drop at this point. First, searching for any conditional statements. Oh my God. In reading comp? <laughs> okay. Uh, then scanning the passage again. Oh boy. For main points and Bullshit. connecting. What are you talking main, about? Scan the points? passage for main points. You can't scan the passage for main points. The main point emerges from the totality of the passage. It's not it doesn't even have to be ex explicitly stated. How the hell are you supposed to scan the passage for the main point? Main points, mind you. Poor Alexander. Thanks for writing in. I'm sorry that you encountered this tutor first. Um, and I'm glad that you've left. I, I, th I think you have. Anyways, uh, you continue. Uh, you then connect any conditional statements or premises with a main point on an extra sheet of paper. On reading comp. Wow, this is just bad. This is pearls versus what? turds, but turd after turd after turd. I also was given RC flashcards to help me memorize and drill question types on my own time. <laughs> For reading comp? <laughs> question types? They're all, all must, be must be true. Yeah, except for like one, a section might be a strengthening question. Anyways, I started with a diagnostic of 148 and I have only been able to increase my score to a 150 in the four months and $1,500 I paid him. Well, I'm glad your score <laughs> didn't drop. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of surprising that your score didn't drop. I mean, that was every single one of those tips was bad. Really bad. Just a complete distraction and harmful. I'm signed up for the September and October exam, and I hope to get a 170 to make myself competitive for a JD slash MD program. Nope. Do one or the other, either be an attorney or a doctor. Don't well, be uh, both. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to not I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not argue with that this time around. <laughs> um, I'm arguing with the I'm signed up for September or and October and hope to get a 170. You, you, you've been, you're at 150 after four months of studying. What kind of miracle do you think is going to happen that you're going to now make 20 points of improvement in the September test is like in a month. We have helped people make a lot of progress. 
And, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, it, you, you're, it's already past the September registration deadline, so you're not getting your money back for that one. You might as well just leave yourself registered for that one. And then if you're ready, you could take the test. The October registration deadline is September 1st, which I mean, by the time this airs, you're going to it's like tomorrow. I mean, if your practice test scores aren't like already in the 160s, then you're not going to you shouldn't sign up for that test unless you don't care about the wasted 200 bucks. What do you think, Ben? I think I would unenroll from October. I don't think you want to be tempted by it or accidentally not withdraw and then lose one of your opportunities. Or wait, if you just don't show up. Does no, you got to withdraw. If you, a no show show is on your record. Yeah. And, yeah. OK, so just get out of these because you need to be scoring in the high 160s if you want to break 170 for your plan. Yeah, I'm really sorry, Alexander. The fifteen hundred dollars that you wasted on this tutor really is less than the four months you wasted on this tutor. You've been going backward. I mean, you, you haven't made any progress. You You've been. All of these things are the wrong way to think about the test. So Alexander says, how do I unlearn what I was taught from my former tutor? You have to develop new habits. And the way to start doing that is to focus on understanding one sentence at a time. If you just do that one thing in all three sections, read a sentence and try to understand it as best you possibly can. And that may mean not even reading the entire sentence. Just maybe read half the sentence and like, do you get it? Do you understand it? Focus entirely on that and keep coming back to that. When you're tempted to diagram, when you're tempted to pull out an extra sheet of paper, when you're tempted to skim, to reread, <laughs> to look for conditional statements, any of that, when it comes into your head, just stop and say, no, no, no. The only thing I have to do is understand the sentence that I'm reading right now. And do I get it? Do I really get it? Does yeah. it make sense? What the author is trying to tell me? Could I tell my nephew what the author is trying to say in words that my nephew could understand? If you can do that, you're starting to build the right habits and just let all of this go. Everything. Yeah, you're, you're doing a weird, you're like doing the LSAT. You need to stop doing the LSAT and you need to start just you need to be a lawyer. What would a lawyer do with this reading comprehension passage? Well, a lawyer would read it and actually understand it. A lawyer would not skim it. A lawyer would actually read it and understand it. Learn everything that's there to be learned. Yep. And you're just you're, you're like, I can't believe you had a tutor who told you not to understand <laughs> the name of the section is reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. So then the tutor who's getting fifteen hundred dollars is like, oh, skim it. Really skim it. That's how I'm going to comprehend it by skimming it. <laughs> it's a bizarre, bizarre situation, too. How do you even write a reading comp question and answer? <laughs> write a whole passage seriously that's what i'm wondering <laughs> then write questions about it it was that just a total like a waste nightmare. of time i mean it's just yeah. ridiculous i don't know who this clown is that you've been working with but i'm glad you fired them and um you know it, this Al alexander i guess you know if you're gonna if you are gonna be ready in september or october here's how that's gonna happen you're gonna do the lsat like as a novice, you're going to forget, you're just going to ignore everything that you've learned. And instead, you're going to focus on reading it and actually understanding it. And you're going to discover that, hey, these questions just make sense. And you're going to start getting them all right at the beginning of each section. You're definitely going to run out of time at the end of the section, but who cares? You guess on those. And it is possible that if you just turn off the LSAT brain thing, and instead turn on the, hey, I'm going to act like a lawyer here and I'm going to read this and I'm going to actually understand it. And you do that instead. It's possible that you could just immediately be in the 160s. We have no idea where you're really at. Yep. <laughs> we, we yeah, you got I mean, 148. I don't know what that means. It's very possible that you rushed through that 148 half assed all the questions and, you know, got half of them right and got a 148. If you slowed down, did fewer questions, but just made sure that you were choosing right answers, it is possible. 
I mean, we see sometimes people who tell us that we've probably got emails later on this exact agenda where it's like, hey, guys, I've been with the demon for three weeks and I went from 148 to 162. Yeah. Well, that's not because of magic information that we gave them. That's because our whole method is like, OK, we're going to read this together. We're going to actually understand what it says. We're going to see how it makes perfect sense on the page. And yeah, the answer is B. And yeah, it really is that easy. And then we move on and do another one. And you really can score in the 160s based like only on easy questions. Just make sure you get all of the easy questions right at the beginning of every section and you should be damn near 160. I'm curious. Do we have story time for the demon free stuff? We do. Looks like. Yep. So tell Alexander what that is. Yeah, exactly. So go ahead and sign up for demon free and then hit reading comp drill and then do reading comp and you'll do one passage. You'll be given one passage and you need to read and understand it just like what we talked about. And then when you're done answering all the questions, when you get into review, you'll see a video. Looks like this first one here is with Nathan reading the passage to you and telling you exactly what he's thinking as he's reading that passage. So he's going to read it sentence by sentence. He's not going to skim it. He's not going to diagram no. it. He's not going to scan for conditional statements. Instead, he's going to read it sentence by sentence, tell you what that sentence is saying and what his reaction to that sentence is and where he thinks the passage is going. And that's how you need to start reading these passages. And you can you can start to mimic exactly what Nathan or anyone else who's uh, done story time is doing. I think it's, it's about me actual and understanding. You, yep. you just you have to carefully read it. You have to get as much as you can get out of that passage. When you do that, you'll be able to predict the answer to half or more of the questions and the right answers will look obvious to you and the wrong answers will look like garbage because they're just not what the passage said. And yeah. then you just, oh, you're answering them right because the questions make sense. Mm hmm. And you can get to the 160s. I mean, we see people start in the 160s sometimes. And that's just people who are careful readers and take their time with it. And instead of doing this weird race the clock thing. Thanks for writing in and good luck. This next email is from Andrew. What's up, guys? I'm Andrew and I have a question regarding my diagnostic and potential improvement along with how I should approach studying for the test. I'm a demon free subscriber, but I have mostly been going through seven sages core curriculum since mid June. I don't know anything about that. I have also listened to a few of your podcasts and I like your approach to the test and law school itself. At the end of this April, I scored a 158 on the June 2007 diagnostic test from LSAC, which with a minus 11 on the games, minus four and minus eight on the logical reasoning and a minus two on the reading comprehension. I really wish you would have done that, Andrew. It would have been great if you would have done that test on the demon because demon free has that test. Not only that, but we have videos and written explanations for every question on that whole test. So doing it on LSAC means you don't get any advice or God, if you do get <laughs> like their advice about the questions is not good. It's a little bit of a workaround, but one thing Andrew could do here, if there's still any value in going back and reviewing this, is you can start the June 2007 test, do end and submit, and then edit your answers in review and just put in what you put in before. Mm. Also, you could just go straight into the explanations, right? Mm -hmm. And just yep. look up explanations on our demon free. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, you struggled a lot with the games. Um to clarify where that is, by the way, that's going to practice, then going to tools. And then once inside the tools menu, you'll see explanations and you can uh, find explanations for all the tests in Demon Free, which is this June test, I think test 65 and test yeah. 73. Yeah. Okay. Here's the questions. One, how long should it take for me to perfect the logic games section? I don't know. It's different for everybody. It took me like six weeks. It takes other people 
less than that, rarely more than that frequently. Um, and it can take a year or more. I mean, there's 400, roughly 400 games to work on. And some people need to do all 400 of those games before they get close to perfect or they do all 400 and they're still not perfect. So they start doing them again. I mean, I, it depends on you've got a ways to go minus 11 on LG. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm studying one to two hours a day, five to seven days a week. And after a few weeks of drilling logical reasoning, I have been exclusively doing games until I get them perfectly. Uh, what? I don't know Listen what to this, means. Ben. Yeah. I do feel like I'm more familiar with the games, but it still takes me anywhere from three to six tries to get a game correct on time. You know, this is related to the. This is we Seven get, Sage. Yeah, we get Seven Sage refugees who talk about this um, foolproofing. I think that that's yeah. what the, I think that's what this is doing here is trying to quote foolproof the game. Yeah, that's that's not that's this is not good. What you're doing, Andrew, is not good. You're really wasting time. Why are you timing yourself? on the same game multiple times when you what you're trying to get faster at it but all you're doing is memorizing the game yeah and the rules and how to apply <laughs> if them. that exact game was going to be on the test then this would be a great strategy <laughs> because yeah. you're memorizing the game so great i mean this would be a good strategy to do the day before the test like cram just do the same game over and over and over and over and over and over and over until you can do it on time and then, OK, give me the test right now. I want to do the test right now and do the test and replicate that exact same game on time. But the actual well, at test, that point, you just memorize <laughs> the answer. So <laughs> I know <laughs> it's just so silly because how do you not just have the whole thing memorized? And yeah, just the answer key is the important part hmm. if you're doing it that way. But I, I don't. And Andrew says this hasn't improved a ton in the time I've been doing them. Is this to be expected? And how, after how many times should I expect the games to start clicking? Dude. So do a game, review it, learn how you could have done worlds when you didn't. Try the game again using worlds or using worlds in a different way. If you don't know what we're talking about, you'll know instantly the second you start watching our videos. And then go to another game and keep doing that until you've done lots and lots of games. Yeah, you're not it's this. This is like banging your head against the wall. You know, it's like, well, I'm not I'm not learning how to do it better. I'm just doing it again. Starting the timer again, like, can I do it in eight minutes? If I can't do it in eight minutes, then I got to do it again. And then I got to do it again. Your problem is that you aren't like implementing any smart solutions to the puzzle you're not you're not like finding shortcuts in the puzzle itself you're just brute forcing the repetition yeah totally i mean the problem with the games is that you can prove why an answer is correct by testing out each individual answer that's not an effective way to approach the games but it is a way and so if you're trying to get faster at that, you're just reinforcing a yeah. system, a solution that's going to well, not work. Also, if you're just trying to get faster, like I imagine maybe Andrew is like he does the game and he cl clicks the stopwatch and he looks at it and he goes seven minutes and 59 seconds. Yes. Yeah. And then he looks at the answers and one of them or two of them are wrong. Damn it. OK, I got to try again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just go back and do the exact same process again, like yeah. where you're not. I mean, Andrew, the watch our videos, go, definitely go to the explanations tab and watch our videos in, in demon free. I think you probably have access to, I don't know, a few dozen videos um, from the logic games. And the idea is watch a little bit of it and then hit pause, like just get a sense of how we're going to solve the system, hit pause, make your own diagram, then answer the questions, then see if you got them right. Stop worrying about the timing, though. Your problem is that you're not creating good enough solutions, like you're not integrating the rules of the system to to learn about how the system works. 
you're just rushing right into the questions because you got the clock ticking and oh, I got to get it done in eight minutes. That's not a good way to learn these games. Okay. Next question. Number two on Reddit. I see a lot of people claiming that their RC section has gotten harder over time, which worries me because it is supposedly the hardest section to improve on. I was very happy with my diagnostic score. That was a 158. Uh, I think he means the minus two. Yep. Oh, the minus two on reading comp. Yep. From the June 2007 test. I see. Yep. But I am very nervous that my RC score might drop more than a few points in later PTs, and I won't be able to achieve my goal score of 174 plus no matter how well I do in the logical reasoning and the logic games. If it drops, start working on it. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm, yeah, I don't know what else to say there. There's nothing you can control. Whether the RC has or has not gotten harder, it is what it is. I don't. For me, if I do reading comp from the modern tests, I don't think it's harder. Other people have no problem with the modern reading comp. On Reddit, people say whatever. I mean, who I, like get off Reddit? Honestly, it's not when you're on Reddit, you're not studying for the LSAT. I don't know what you're doing, but you're not studying for the LSAT. You're probably comparing yourself to other people, which is very bad for mental health. Go ahead. Well, I'd say get off Reddit, but also get off of uh, Seven Sages core curriculum. I don't know what's in there, but unless it's practice problems, I feel like you're trading some marginal benefit, if any, for doing actual problems. And that's just way more beneficial. Like our core curriculum is the practice tests. Let's do these tests and let's figure them out together. Let's do questions together. Figure it out. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, yeah. You st you're struggling with the games. Let's do a game. You're struggling with the reading comp. Cool. Let's do a reading comp passage. Let's work on the actual test instead of whatever this core curriculum is. Look at this next question. Should I continue to exclusively focus on LG until I get minus zero every time and move on to the other sections? Or should I just jump into PTing and fix mistakes as I move along? I haven't taken a PT since my diagnostic due to me working my way through Seven Sages core curriculum. And that was back in April, Ben. Yeah, this thing is a distraction. It's not helpful. You got to be doing, I mean, you should at least be doing timed sections. And the, I don't like this. this is, these are the only two choices you think you have. Like either I'm going to focus exclusively on games until I perfect them every time or I'm going to jump all the way to the over to the other extreme of taking practice tests. What every couple of days? No, you can drill. You've seen that in the demon. You can drill. You should break it up. You should do some game. Maybe you're doing more games than the other two sections because you're worse at them. But we're talking maybe 50, 60 percent of your time is games and then split the remaining time between reading comp and logical reasoning. If you do that, you'll yeah. discover whether or not the more recent reading comp passages are harder for you or not, and you can learn from your mistakes. The whole point is not about <laughs> avoiding failure or something like yeah. that. It's go do work, learn from your mistakes, and move on. And you should, this is like training for a triathlon, so no one should be doing exclusively any one section for a prolonged period of time. There you go. <laughs> Andrew's like, worrying about the reading comp but not actually doing reading comp because mm -hmm. he's so focused on this perfecting the games but now the games are getting in the way of you studying the other sections of the test and yeah i mean look do a practice test <laughs> it's been a while do a test yeah. see how you do and then study for another couple of weeks and then do another test and by study you mean do time sections or drilling yeah. None of this other mistakes. studying. So who is this? Andrew. Andrew thinks that studying is the core curriculum. And it, no, no, it's not. Well, it's yeah, that core curriculum, it, it apparently isn't doing anything for you. It's leading you down some wrong paths. So I just wouldn't wouldn't go there. Um, what do you think about this? I'm getting restless and would like to start practice testing if it means I could spend less time and money mm. prepping for the test. 
It will save you time. That's for sure. You've been wasting a lot of your precious time yeah. reading lessons. So it will save you time. I'm worried about you saving money. I want you to save money, but I, I'm concerned that you're going to... What are you going to do? You're going to do a practice test and then not have explanations or good explanations to review it. And then you're going to end up wasting more of your time. Yeah. But your time is your most valuable resource. I mean, if you're, if you're studying one to two hours a day, five to seven days a week, that's a pretty big range, by the way, at a minimum, that's five hours a week at mm -hmm. a maximum, that's 14 hours a week. So five is maybe not enough. 14 mm -hmm. would be plenty. 14 would be maybe more than enough. But, you know, you got to get more value out of that time. So, yeah, I agree. You're definitely wasting time. Anyway, I don't know. I don't think I have any more advice. Yep. Thanks for writing in. The next one is from 170 and beyond hopeful. Hello, about a year ago, I self-studied with old practice tests from the local library, hmm. took a, the LSAT officially and got a 158. Reading online and using your scholarship estimator, I decided a higher score is definitely necessary for admissions and scholarship purposes. Uh, we agree. I decided to take a six, six months off from studying and start fresh with my LSAT journey. In my journey, I deduced... I wanted to utilize some kind of study program. I started off with Seven Sage since I was able to utilize my fee waiver and can watch video lessons in between work. I work full time. By the way, you can use your fee waiver at the Demon. Gets you a lot of good stuff. You can use it. You can't utilize it. But you, can you can use, use it. it at the Demon. <laughs> yeah. Um, for thirty dollars, you get four months of Demon Basic, which would normally be three hundred and eighty dollars, I think, or something like that for those four months. So yeah. that's uh, very, very discounted. Um, in any case, I was a user of Seven Sage for about seven months. This past June, July, my scores have been wildly varying between 10 practice tests, ranging from 160 to 166. That's not a huge No, that is variation. not hardly any variation, let alone wild variation. Yeah, I, I realize that it feels that way, but no, you're, you're, you're doing... What is very common. That's uh, narrower just, than most people's ranges or many people's ranges. Yep. I had enough of overcomplicated explanations and switched to the demon. Realized you two also have fee waiver benefits. Wished I had known sooner. Oh, sorry. Anyways, I wanted to see if you guys have any recommendations for someone who is in this range and some general advice moving forward with the demon. I'm aiming for the 170s. P.S. I love your drilling feature and I have been starting there so far. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. Any advice? You're in a great doing range. What, yeah. I mean, yeah. you're you're doing well. You you can do better. You're with the demon now. I think you're in the right place doing the right things. I would uh yeah, some mix of Drilling, which you're already doing, you have to start mixing in some timed sections. If you're not doing that already, you should be doing timed sections pretty regularly. I mean, the thing that we recommend is just do one of each type per week. It's not that hard. 35 minutes or, you know, 53 minutes or 70 minutes if you're accommodated, but whatever. Do one of each type per week timed. Don't rush. Ignore the clock, but do time yourself and see how far you get. Focus on accuracy. Make sure you're getting them right. Thoroughly review all your mistakes. You know, that's an hour and a half. Hour to an hour and a half practice section, practice session for most people to do the section and then review it. Do that three times a week. One games, one LR, one RC. And then squeeze in drilling everywhere else. <laughs> and drill everywhere else. Yep. Watch yep. videos, read written explanations, use the ask button. If you're not occasionally using the ask button, I think you're not doing it right. Right. Do you agree with that, Ben? I mean, yeah, there's got to be things you don't understand even after you read the explanation and watch the videos. We have a team of tutors that are behind that ask button right now. It's been mm -hmm. Lily who's been kicking ass doing all of the responses. But 
Abigail's there too. And we have other team members that chime in from time to time. Yep. And like, you can't be perfectly satisfied with all of this stuff. It, you know, you watch a video and you'll hear me or Ben say something where you're like, wait, what now? I don't, uh, or in the written explanation, one of the answer choices, the dismissal of that answer just won't be satisfying to you. It's not don't satisfying to us sometimes. Sometimes right. I'm reading the explanations. I'm like, wait, I don't think the explanation for D is correct. Fix, please. And right. the ask team will work on it and they'll make it better. Right. And and if you're not doing that sometimes during your prep, then I don't think you're squeezing every bit of learning. Like there's a click there that you're not getting. You're just moving on to another question. No, no, you need to get that click. The whole point is to get the clicks. By click, he means understanding. <laughs> yeah, that just moment where you go, oh, shit, that didn't make any sense to me. And now I see how it makes 100 percent perfect sense. That's yeah. the click. And you got to be really thirsty for those clicks. And the ask button is one of the ways that you can get that. So I would encourage you to do that as you work toward 170. Cool. This last, last one. email is from G. Yeah, you this came it? into the daily, but um, I moved it over here because we've been getting kind of inundated um, daily. <laughs> LSAT Demon Daily is starting to do well on YouTube. If you would like to see shorter videos that are more kind of topically focused, go check out LSAT Demon on YouTube. Um, so this question yep. came in over there, says, hey, Ben and Nathan, how's it going? It's going good. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's going good here, too, as well. Um in case you guys need a reason to smile today or others need a boost of motivation to keep going in their studies, maybe this would do. I'm one of those wayward souls who had an OK diagnostic of 152, but tanked on the actual test ages ago after trying to prep elsewhere. The official scores from back then were, or I guess are, 147, 148, 150, ouch. So that's a bummer, man. That's three official Ooh. scores all lower than the diagnostic. Nothing wrong with those practice test scores. That's just part of learning. But because they're official. That's the tragedy is that you put yeah. those on your record. Those should be on your practice test record. On your practice test record, it would be like, OK, so. All right. Solidly high 140s, 150. All right. Let's look at those mistakes. Let's keep going. Yeah. Instead, you put those officially on your record because you just weren't you clearly weren't ready to take the test. And that Which, that is a bit of a ouch. It doesn't matter that they're on your record for the fact that they're low. It's just a wasted opportunity. Right. That's really what the issue is. Law schools only care about your highest score, but you are limited to five times in five years. So, you know, you got two more bullets to fire officially. Mm -hmm. yep. Unless these are ages. You said it's ages ago. So maybe it's old enough now that they've actually expired off of your official record, which is possible. Or happened in that window of time when they weren't tracking these things. And remember, <laughs> there was that time or, when they didn't count. <laughs> yep. And or I think that that's pretty easy to get waivers to mm. like they, you know, they have that limit because they don't want people taking the test who aren't actually applying to law school. I mm -hmm. think if you can convince them, hey, I took these tests way back then. I really am serious about it this time. Now I'm going to apply to law school in fall of 2023. I need more attempts to take the test. I think that they're probably going to listen to that argument. Yeah. At least based on what I've seen from other people who have appealed. Yep. To push through some test anxiety, I gave the sections from two of those exams a shot for some of my most recent practice tests. So G went back and redid these tests that they had done officially back in the day and then did them uh, now. The results. Number one, my 147 official exam, I scored 172 in the demon. Number two, my 148 official exam, I scored 169 in the demon. I wasn't thrilled about the 169 since it's at the bottom of my current practice test range, and it might not sound like much overall since those old tests are already on my official score report, but it still feels like a solid personal win. You agree, Absolutely. Ben? Is that a solid yeah. personal win? That's a win. Yeah, you took something that was hard for you and you have started to master it. Well, you've started to actually understand it. Yeah. Like at 147, you're just not making sense of it. Mm -hmm. At 172, you're making sense of all the easy stuff 
and some of the medium hard stuff. And that's great. Even if I'm not at my 173 to 175 plus goal yet, from the scholarship estimator, 173 starts triggering money at Wash U or University of Florida for me, and 175 or more uh, kicks in scholarships at BU and UCLA. Okay. That's a very broad range geographically, man. Florida <laughs> to Boston to St. Louis, California. to LA. So <laughs> yeah. applying real broadly, love that. Mm -hmm. And they say, at least I beat some of the same tests that skewered me years ago. Progress, exclamation point. And screw you, LSAT, exclamation point. <laughs> Just kidding, G says. I kind of love this test now. Thanks to you guys and the demon for getting me here. Best G. Aw, it's awesome. Nice work. Yeah, keep it that's up. That's awful nice. Glad you're using the scholarship estimator. That's at lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships to figure out what kinds of scores you might need to get yourself that full ride. Um, since you're considering BU, I hope that our discussion at the top of the show about uh, their distinguished scholars <laughs> <laughs> versus those who are BU bound. <laughs> that's so uh, odd. I wonder if they have useful. any awareness of no, that. If was they like clearly a joke? don't. That was one of those <laughs> accidental... <laughs> like what was the law school recently that just renamed themselves and they're now ass law? Was it the um it, Oh yeah, Anton and Scalia School of yeah, Law. Yeah, that's right in my backyard. That's GMU. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's George Mason. And they're not GMU anymore. Now they're ass law. Yeah. Anton and um, Scalia School of Law. Wow. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um I don't think BU with their BU bound. It's got this like jaunty, optimistic, like, oh, yeah, I'm BU bound. But then it has this other meaning, which is totally accurate, which is a little darker. Yep. Anyway, thanks, G. Thanks for. Yeah, me. thanks. Be LSAT famous. Get on an upcoming show by emailing help at thinkinglsat.com. If you have questions about LSAT Demon, email help at lsatdemon.com. You can also check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. Especially on YouTube. Yep, you can see us. You can see our faces, our ugly faces. That was episode 365 of the Thinking Else Podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing ya. Don't pay for law school. <laughs>